looking back on the week that was and forward to the week ahead, it's the Fantasy Football Hustle. Waiver wire, trades, roster management. To win in fantasy football, you must remember one simple rule. Never get out hustled. It's the Fantasy Football Hustle. Here are your hosts, Brian Drake and Dwayne McFarland. Tuesday night. The beers are cracked, my friends. And it's time to hustle. It's podcast night in America, folks. And the Fantasy Football Hustle is on the air. What is going on out there in Fantasy Football land? It's your boy, Brian Drake, alongside Dwayne McFarland. We are the hosts of the Fantasy Football Hustle. And for the next hour or so, we're going to be diving in to some high-stakes fantasy football drafts that our old pal Dwayne has done. And we're going to talk a lot of Scott Fishbowl, as Dwayne and I both have teams in FF... uh, Let's see if I can do this right. Hashtag SFB9. There you go. It's e- <laughs> you so much it. easier when I write it out, man. And uh, Hey, just before we get going here, we are proud members of the FullTimeFantasy.com podcast network. You can head over to FullTimeFantasy.com. Check out all the great contests they're running over there. And we're going to talk about one of those tonight as Dwayne was in an online championship to win some cash. So we'll get into that tonight. Dwayne, what's going on, man? What are you drinking, first of all? Oh, dude, this is terrible. <laughs> I, I ran out of beer, so I'm drinking one of my wife's beers. So it's, let's see, it's Michelob Ultra Infusions. And I mean, am I going to lose my man? I may lose my man card on this. Lime, lime and prickly pear cactus. Hang on. Let me see here. Oh, God. Drake, that's, yeah, it's a beer, barely. Um, <laughs> I was a beer salesman for seven years, so I vividly remember rolling that one out. Yeah, when it says infused with exotic, with real exotic fruit on that, your beer, that's, yeah. I got a Two Roads Little Juicy New England IPA. For I, I hope feel like it, you should say it in like a, you know, in an accent. You know, it's, it's a light lager with a real exotic fruit and natural flavor. That sounds terrible. Like, why would an Australian be drinking this? That's where that went. No, I they, think I was thinking. King of Fosters, Australian for beer. Remember those commercials? They'd punch you in the nuts if they knew you were drinking that. <laughs> Fosters, Australian for beer. So anyway. if you want to follow us on Twitter, I'm at Drake Fantasy. Dwayne is at Dwayne McFarland, spelled at D-W-A-I-N. And oh, by the way, Dwayne writes for a couple of really good fantasy websites. So you might want to check him out over there at footballguys.com and mattwaldmanrsp.com. And both of us can be found at full time, or excuse me, at fightingchancefantasy.com. Ryan Halen's going to come punch me in the nuts now for messing that one up. But uh, He said he's been wanting to do that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. So it's Scott Fishbowl season. If you're a fantasy football fan on Twitter, you've been seeing the hashtag and all of your favorite analysts are just immersed in Scott Fishbowl mania as the draft kicked off on Monday. And uh, what pick did you have and what league are you in, Dwayne? Man, I got the seventh pick and I am in the PlayStation Classics and I am in the uh, Sweet Tooth division. So uh, Ali Fontana from Fantasy Fix. Uh, I got a, uh, we've got a fan, Michael Optus. He's at US New York Rep. So he's in government of some sort. Seems like a cool dude. We haven't really asked him about his job. But anyway, a lot of really cool people. Uh, another football guy's uh, gentleman in here, James Brimacombe, is in this league. Um, so a bunch of really, really cool people um, having a good time in the chat room. Almost as much fun just doing the chat room stuff as it is to do the draft. Absolutely. I have the 110 pick in the the Cole McGrath. I don't even know what, what or who that is. I don't know what video game it's from. I never took the time to care to Google it, but uh, I have the 110 pick. I'm actually on the clock. Uh, As we were going on the air, I got the email that I'm on the clock. So we're going to make a pick uh, live. I'm going to have Dwayne help me go through it because he's infinitely smarter and better at fantasy football than I am. Uh, And then I'm going to disappoint him with the guy that I actually take. Uh, (laughs) My draft, it's cool. I've got some big name guys. I've got Josh Norris from Roto World, um, Chris Myers from Athlon Sports, uh, Rad Thad from Guru Elite, uh, John Daly from Fantasy Pro. So we got guys from all over the place. It's a it's a good group here. But let's talk about what we did with our first few picks. My draft is freaking slow. Oh my god, we're only we're three day, what two almost three days into this. We haven't even finished the third round. Oh. Doesn't help the guys pause for their podcast to do their uh, you know pick lab in the air, but whatever. 
So, Dwayne, let's talk about your draft here in the Scott Fish Bowl. You have the seventh overall pick. Where do you go in the first round? Yeah, with the first pick, I went with David Johnson, and I passed on uh, Travis Kelsey to do that. I passed on Patrick Mahomes, passed on all on all of the other, you know, elite receivers. Um, and this is one of those stances that, you know, as recently as three or four weeks ago, I pretty much every time was drafting DeAndre Hopkins in the mid-stake type drafts that I was doing. And I don't, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about it. And, you know, part of it is, you know, we had, you know, Jarrett Moyer on last week. I've had several conversations with Matt Waldman on his podcast. Then, you know, Sigmund Bloom came on and, you know, he talked to us, you know, and, and Bloom, you know, and his wild eyed love for certain players. And, you know, with David Johnson, you know, in this particular format, it bumped him up just because, you know, you get the the bonus points, the five bonus points for 50 yards receiving or 50 yards rushing. Mm-hmm. So I just felt, and with the first down stuff, I felt that runner, you know, if you, if I could, David Johnson was where my tear stopped. If David Johnson had been gone, I would have went with the other, with one of the receivers, but I was very happy to get David Johnson in this format. And I'm hoping that he can be as good as what some of these, you know, folks believe that he can be. I'm still a little worried about the Cardinals offense. Vegas does only have them at six wins. There's a reason why right. there's a lot of things about that offense that, that yes, it's going to be a better offense. It's going to be Cliff Kingsbury. It's going to be all those things, but you have a lot of young receivers that don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> that are going to be trying to figure this crap out. You got an old dude that you're asking to play outside and then you got a rookie quarterback and you got a bad offensive line. So things aren't, I don't think things are going to be as rosy as people think, but I am very excited the more and more I think about it, about David Johnson's role in the offense because of the mismatches he creates. And those are easy passes. And so I do think the field will be spread out more for him, uh, whether they're leading or whether they're trailing. And I think that's good news for him as well. So I see nothing but positives for David Johnson versus where he was last year. His touchdown upside may be a little bit low, but I was excited to get David Johnson with my first pick. And like I said, passed on Travis Kelsey, uh, who or that was the guy I was struggling with. Did I want David Johnson or did I want Travis Kelsey? And the reason Dwayne was considering Travis Kelsey and some of you out there who aren't big Scott Fishbowl fans might be thinking like, why the hell would you take a guy like that so early? Uh, this is a league that favors the tight end. There's 1,200 teams in this, first of all. There's 112 team divisions, okay? It's a 22-round slow draft. You're going to start one quarterback, two running backs, three receivers, one tight end, four flexes, one of which can be a super flex with a quarterback. The scoring, uh, you know, like Dwayne mentioned with the some of the bonuses, you're going to get a half point PPR. So I think a lot of people thought it was full point PPR. It's actually half point PPR. Yeah. Uh, and it's half point per first down. But the tight ends get an extra 0.5 for their catches and their first downs. So if you have somebody like, uh, spoiler alert, I took Zach Ertz in this draft, uh, who catches, let's just, on the low end, say he catches 80 balls versus a guy who I was considering like Juju Smith-Schuster, that's like an extra 30 points just based off his bonuses he's going to get for catching the ball. So that's kind of why you'll see people going so tight end crazy here. Anything wild happened in the first round of your draft? Nothing wild. Um, I mean, Hopkins went at uh, five, which isn't crazy. I've done that myself. Um, You know, Kelsey went at uh, nine. So, I mean, no, nothing really crazy. Um, You know, Mahomes, that's normal because it's a quarterback flex league. So Mahomes went in the first round. Um, I guess the, the part where it got like a little bit crazy for me and, and it's not really nutty, but it's what this draft does This Odell Beckham Jr. Fell back to me in the second round. I didn't think I would get to start with David Johnson and Odell Beckham Jr. I was thinking, that. I was thinking it'd be Mike Thomas. Well, Devonte Adams was two picks from getting back to me. Oh, the guy that took Kelsey got to turn around and take Devonte Adams. Yeah, and because so it's, Stephen Middleton is the name of the guy. He's from ESPN 580 AM in Orlando, Florida. Uh, but he uh, he took Kelsey and then turned around with Adams, and then he got Keenan Allen in the third round at pick nine. So I mean, then came back with Devontae Freeman in the fourth. So I mean, yeah, he, he got some draft really, yes, and he did a good job with that. I thought he did a good job with that. Hmm. So that's how that you know 
that's how that went. You know, Deshaun Watson goes at the end of the second round. Uh, then Andrew Luck goes at the very last pick of the second round. Um, you know, Nick Chubb fell in, you know, slipped into the, to the third round. Mike Evans slipped into the, into the third round. Those are all things that are happening because of, you know, the quarterback flex. It starts pushing some of these other guys down. So I got Aaron Jones in the middle of the third. I passed uh, your boy Damian Williams for him. And, and I, I really have him graded, you know, at this point, almost right. They're neck and neck. I just mm-hmm. happen to like Aaron Jones more. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, and this is where it starts to change, right? So you get into the third round and it goes Mayfield Wentz on the turn because, because especially if you're on the, on the, if you're, yes, that's, that was the turn. Yep. So this guy started, uh, with Mixon, Ertz, then he goes Mayfield Wentz. So, um, and some folks, you know, when you're on the turns, you have to be careful because you'll, you'll get snapped off. I'm sitting in the middle, so I can kind of sit here and read the board. So it's a little bit of a different strategy. Um, but for me in these types of leagues, I've played in these type of leagues forever where you have, you know, flex, you know, you flex your quarterbacks and you have multiple other flex spots. And I've always found, and, and the data will tell you this too, the best thing to do is still wait on quarterback, especially when the rules like this one, the way they're set up, there's so much additional, there's so many additional ways for your quarterbacks to do better, like those rushing yards and things like that. It really brings, you know, a lot of guys closer together. So even though their scoring goes up because it's six per passing touchdown. Um, and, and it does differentiate because picks are minus four, which is going to hurt me because I've my first quarterback is Jameis Winston. So mm-hmm. that does hurt me, but I get him in the sixth round. Um, but my point being is that a lot of the quarterbacks start to clump together because of the way the rules work. There's so many different ways to score as a quarterback. You don't just have to be an elite passer. You can be somebody that is a decent rusher and it actually helps you more than normal. So third round, I got Aaron Jones coming back in the fourth round. Um, I got Leonard Fournette, which I was super happy with. I mean, I don't want Fournette in the third, but give me a back that as long as he's healthy, he's going to see 300 touches in the fourth round and I'm going to take it. I don't know if we shared with folks, this is a, the, the starting requirements are one quarterback, two running backs, three receivers, one tight end, and then you get four flex mm-hmm. four. So Basically, the way I approach these is you just keep taking the best players every pick. If you have certain guys you don't want, great. You mark them off your list, but you don't have to force it, you know, really anywhere, you know, until you feel like there's a scarcity and there's an issue. So Leonard Fournette in the fourth round. And then coming back, I got Julian Edelman in the fifth, which Julian Edelman, you know, in most like high stake and mid stake drafts that I've done so far this summer, he's a late third, early fourth. And so in this format, he falls all the way to the middle of the fifth. He's my wide receiver, two behind Odell Beckham Jr. Uh, and then coming back in the six, I didn't want to, but I had to. I needed to make sure I got one of the quarterbacks, so I went ahead and took Winston. But, man, it was so hard to pass up because, uh, you know, like DJ Moore was sitting there. Uh, Dante Pettis is sitting there. Um, there's a lot of receivers. You know, I still don't own a tight end. But at some point, you know, you kind of got to eat your vegetables. David Montgomery, you know, is still sitting there. Mm. I saw I saw leagues the other day where that guy was going in, like, the third round and mm-hmm. stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot of players to like. Daryl Henderson's still out there. There's, there's, there's a lot of players with a lot of upside still on the board here, but I just didn't want to be snapped off. This league is really like drafting like, in a best ball kind of GPP tournament team because you've got to get through your league, which is, I think, 13 weeks or so, and then you get clumped in with all the other division winners to try to win some crazy, like, three-week tournament to be crowned the Scott Fishbowl champion. So it's not about just drafting the safe redraft team that you're going to see in your home league. You got to take a few chances and you got to, you really have to hit. And we're going to see how Dwayne does this as we break down um, one of his drafts from the FFWC. Uh, You got to take some shots on some guys who are going to be Mr. Waiver Wire three months from now. You know, you got to have those guys in your back pocket. You're exactly right. And, this actually goes back to something we talked about about a month ago. Remember that I wrote an article on for fighting chance fantasy, just around draft strategy and roster construction. You don't want to be the guy that goes all upside because then you're the guy that, you know, or, or the gal, you know, that's freaking two and six. And then finally your players come around, but your season's over. So you don't want to be that person, but you also don't want to be the person that sits back and thinks, well, I don't know for sure about Aaron Jones. Well, I, I don't Leonard Fournette. He, he could get, he could get hurt. He could be hurt. Julian Edelman, he's old. I mean, there's a mil- there, you can paint a story to every player, 
right? Julian Edelman, to me, is a great floor player. Leonard Fournette is more risky. Aaron Jones is more risky, but the upside is there. David Johnson and and Odell Beckham Jr., you know, those are just kind of your first two studs. So when you build your draft strategy, you really want to – you want to build it in a way that you're layering in different types of guys. You want your upside guys. You want your floor guys. But ultimately, you know, you need a good mix of those to be competitive. Let's talk about Leonard Fournette for a second. This is a guy last year who was a top six, seven pick by ADP. Now, last year, obviously, he was banged up. He missed a bunch of games. Still scored just six touchdowns. Uh, And there's other guys out there who, you know, played an entire season and couldn't get that many touchdowns. With Nick Foles coming in to Jacksonville, and you've got an offense that looks to be a little more diverse, and they're going to be able to put move the ball down the field aerially, which they could never do with Blake Bortles. Are we going to see maybe less base defenses for Leonard Fournette to rush against? So now he's getting to run against a nickel D like Todd Gurley got to every single play last year, and that could really help a big bruiser like him. I think there's a potential for it. You know, if you think about John Filippo coming over from Minnesota after he got fired by Mike Zimmer, um, you know, he's a little bit more of a pass heavy approach versus what uh, Doug Marone has been recently. Um, and he does like to run a lot of 11 personnel. And if it makes sense, right. When you think about Adam Thielen in your slot, um, you know, uh, for the Vikings last year. So um, there's the possibility of that. And they do have a nice slot receiver. I'm sure we'll talk about later, which is DD Westbrook. So there's some potential for it. Um, I don't know how creative they'll get with that. My thing with Leonard Fournette is that, one, really it's only about injury because TJ Yeldon's gone. TJ mm-hmm. Yeldon was literally the guy that would come on and take all of the uh, two-minute passing drill work. He would come on the field and he would take you know the third and longs. That's gone. Fournette's going to get most of those looks now because uh, – you know, the rookie that they drafted, uh, Armstead, he's not good at those things. He is literally, he's a running back. He is not a receiver. So we're going to see how things play out. You know, they do have some other guys on the roster, you know, that we could talk about. But Alfred in the Blue, end, baby. Yeah, and Alfred Blue, also not a receiver. So for me, when I think about Leonard Fournette, honestly, this year, I think he's a guy that could – easily get to 50 catches if he's healthy. So if you give me a guy that could give me 275 to 300 carries and give me somewhere between 40 and 60 catches, which I think are all with it squarely within his range of outcomes and you get a you get him in the third or the fourth round, you know, I think you could do a lot worse. And so I was super excited to get him in the fourth round of the fishbowl. All right, my draft was Melvin Gordon at the 110. Now Melvin Gordon's a guy who by ADP is going 6 7 8 most drafts and I got him at the 10 spot I felt pretty fortunate again not a guy I'm doing a backflip naked down the highway because I got but you know hey Melvin Gordon's a really solid running back to plant your flag on and say okay here's my RB1 let's let's rock and roll and go from there in the second round this is weird so the fishbowl turns off their drafting I guess they pause the timer overnight so I got up in the middle of the night the guy, uh, my daughter comes in, she's got to use the bathroom, daddy, blah, blah, blah. I go out, I look, oh, this guy made a pick. I look and I say, all right, well, I'm going to make my selection. I pick Juju Smith-Schuster. I go in the morning, I look and go, how come I'm still on the clock? What's going on here? Apparently the pick didn't take because of <laughs> it was during a pause time. So I got to think about it. I was talking to my man Dwayne here and I go, you know what? Screw it. I'm changing up. I'm going Zach Ertz. Give me the, the guy who's going to get the bonuses and I'm going to not have to worry about tight end for a little while. Let's go with Zach Ertz. So now Which I'm is funny because I love Juju. I mean, too. Right? But at the end of the day, I mean, I, here's what I think, Drake. <clears throat> I like Juju better than Zach Ertz. But the thing is, with getting a guy like Ertz in this tournament, and you're picking down towards the end, so a lot can happen once you make your pick. It, if I'm down towards the end, a lot of times my strategy, if all other things are equal, I will lean to thinking about future position scarcity, because the last thing you want for your team, let's say you take Juju there and let's say he outscores Zach Ertz, even in this format by 20 points. I still don't know that that makes him the right pick for you. The reason why is because eventually whenever your draft, which is probably going to be in like three weeks, you get to round six, (laughs) seven, and you get to round eight. You don't, you don't want to be in a pinch where literally maybe you waited on quarterback and you need two quarterbacks and you still don't have your tight end because those tiers all dry up really quick. Mm -hmm. Whereas receiver, 
what we're seeing, especially right now, Scott Fishbowl. I mean, I'm going, we're about to be coming back in the seventh round and guys that are normally gone in the fifth, like Calvin Ridley, DJ Moore, Tyler Boyd, they're all there. So Allen Robinson is still there. Dante Pettis is still there in my league. So, and, and plus all the guys that we know go even later like that, your Christian Kirks and all those guys are all still there. So I think what you did from that perspective is smart because I think it's going to be harder for the whole receiver tier to dry up on you mm-hmm. than it will be for, you know, the tight end. So now you kind of, you got your guy. If mm-hmm. you get another one and you want to, that's always option. It's open to you, but you don't have to force it now. That's kind of where my head would be. And I, why I think you probably made the right pick. So on the board, let's make this pick right here live on the air. So whenever you're listening to this show, just assume you're you're live with us, okay? Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs are on the board. I obviously do not have a wide receiver at this point. Uh, and quarter, what pick? What pick? Tell the folks what pick you are, Drake. You're... This is pick three ten. Okay? Yeah, okay. So I'll be picking again four picks from now. Um, so I, I've got a little leeway here. That's what you have to do in these drafts, even in your home draft. And I, this is very simple and you should know this, but maybe some people don't, you've got to look at the teams next to you. What do they have? What are they going to need? And kind of look down the board and say, all right, if I take this guy here, will I be able to get him or a comparable replacement I could live with, uh, in the next few picks. So Thielen Diggs are the best wide receivers on the board. Quarterback wise, because again, it's a super flex league. Aaron Rodgers is there. Baker Mayfield, Russell Wilson, Wentz. Um, they're all there. Matt Ryan, OJ Howard's on the board. If I want to double dip and swing for the fences at tight end. And let's see running back wise, carry on Johnson, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones, Josh Jacobs. There's also another guy there, Dwayne. <laughs> There's somebody else hanging out. And some news broke today about Tyreek Hill. The audio came out, and I am no Tyreek Hill fan, mind you. I think the guy's a scumbag. Uh, if you re- read the audio, uh, the clips that came out, if you got to read the transcripts, there's a lot going on here with this guy. But we're going to put that beside or behind us, and we're just going to talk about fantasy football. Tyreek Hill's on the board. If you can swing for the fences with a guy like Tyreek Hill, who's the number one wide receiver in fantasy last year, and I can get him at the 310, maybe I could get him coming back around at 4-3, but I don't know. That's a that's a swing for the fences guy. So, Dwayne, I laid out who's on the board here. Who would you be taking? Uh, who makes the most sense for my roster construction? Well, you know me, I'm taking Aaron Jones and I like literally like wouldn't even blink. I had no clue he was still available for you just because it's Matt LaFleur's offense. <clears throat> it's this is this is the Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan scheme. Um, I will have an article coming out about this this week. That's going to be the projection spectrum for Aaron Jones. That's my new uh, kind of weekly article I'm going to be doing for football guys through the preseason. And it's basically around the range of outcomes for someone. The thing I love about Aaron Jones, he he does have a floor that could scare people. And I get it. You know, because people immediately think, well, he hasn't been healthy or B, you know, Jamal Williams, you know, still going to get half the carries. But essentially what you'll see, you know, in this article is if you really take all the factors into play, you look at really what kind of splits this running game usually gives between the backs. I think worst case scenario, you're looking at like 55 percent of the carries, 50 percent of the carries to Aaron Jones. I think best case, he's getting 65 to 70 percent of the carries. The beauty of this running game is it just shreds everything. This is Kyle Shanahan's running game. Aaron Rodgers, if he and LaFleur can come to an agreement on being under center more, which I think they will because it's going to help Aaron Rodgers because Aaron Rodgers is great at what you need, creating that play action boot out the backside, all of a sudden you got, you know, a guy sitting there in the flat, easy passing yards. He can also get him out of the pocket. He can look downfield, all sorts of great stuff for Aaron Rodgers. But in the end, dude, playing with Aaron Rodgers and being in this running scheme, to me, Aaron Jones, even if he gets capped at 55 to 60 percent, you know, his upside is just huge. You know, I mean, you're talking could easily score 12 touchdowns could easily have 12 to 1300 yards, could easily catch 50 balls for another 400 yards. I mean, that that's what Tyreek Hill's going to want to do if he played the whole season. And that's probably not going to happen. So I would take Aaron Jones and I would let Tyreek Hill come back around the corner to me. That's just me. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's how I was leaning before um, I, I spoke to you. I was looking 
in my magazine here. Shout out to Bob Harris. I'm the one guy that still buys the magazine at the grocery store. But I always take care of Bob Harris because I enjoy listening to his football diehard show on Sirius. So I make it a point to buy one of his magazines every year. Um, it's a good magazine. Yeah. And I was checking out Aaron Jones and on Johnson. And my thought. And, process- I, love, and I love on too. You know me. Sure. But he, I, I just want Theo Riddick out of the way. Until right. Theo Riddick is gone, I see a I see a chance for for I mean not for Nat for um, carry on to be in a three way split. I think Aaron Jones in the worst case, like I said, is like in a fifty five thirty kind of split, and then another ten percent maybe to a Dexter Williams. So I don't think C J Anderson was brought in there just to stand there and hold a clipboard. They saw what he did in the playoffs in the Super Bowl, and they said this guy can still play. C J Anderson's not, you know. Jamal Williams, he's he's a little bit better than just a guy. And so, it is the team that last year kept handing the ball to your favorite guy, LeGarrette like Blount, no matter how bad he was. Love it. So that that scares me. Now, carry on's talent. Oh, goodness. Like, it's like just – I went back and watched all of his games, um, which is like my second time to do that in the last five weeks. It, the dude's amazing. Like, if you just go watch – his games, you literally want to take him in like the second round. <laughs> so it's like, I have to fight myself not to take him. Uh, but it's just, I don't, I don't trust the coaching staff. You know, now if Theo Riddick gets released, dude, watch out. I'll move carry on Johnson way up my draft board. Now, what would you do here? I've had three quarterbacks go off the board in my draft. Mahomes, Watson and luck all went in the third round before my selection here. Would you go quarterback here or on my next pick back? I wouldn't. I wouldn't okay. personally. And, and, and here's, here's why. It's back to what I said earlier. It's all about your scoring format. In this scoring format, guys like Dak Prescott get bumped way up, right, because of the first downs and the rushing yards. Um, Kirk Cousins, because he doesn't throw a lot of picks, is going to be pushed up the board. And really, when you look at it, you know, you have a guy, say, like Pat Mahomes, they may grade out 30 to 40 points higher, maybe 50 than some of these guys versus because there's so many starters in this league because you have four flex, one of which will be a quarterback. So you do need to take two quarterbacks. That has to be your strategy. But I still like waiting a little bit. I like right here, you're kind of in a sweet spot to do some damage, man. You could you could take Aaron Jones and carry on Johnson. You could take Aaron Jones. Is Leonard Fournette still there in this one? He went two picks before I was on the clock. And, and Damian Williams, to, your boy went. Damian Williams. You would have pounded that. Like You would have been so excited. You wouldn't have been able to wait. You would have just been like, click it. Took it so, before the show started. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, you could take a guy like Aaron Jones. I think you're going to turn around and still get a guy like Tyreek Hill. And let's say you don't get Tyreek Hill. You're still going to be staring at an Adam Thielen, mm-hmm. another guy like that, who we know is going to play all 16 games. And honestly – in the time period, you know, that we're talking about there, I don't see Adam Thielen and Tyree kill being super far apart. They're probably going to be 30 points, 30, 40 fantasy points apart. Um, you know, if they were to both play the whole season, you know, so for me, I, I like the idea of going ahead and grabbing Aaron Jones first. You can still get a receiver coming back. And then worst case scenario, you could just decide, I'm just gonna go ahead and take carry on Johnson too. I'm drafting in my home league that I'm a commissioner. I care about more than my children. I'm drafting 11th. So I've had extensive research here at the back of the draft drafting. And I've noticed that if you go, say, in a redraft setting, you go with, like, say, a Juju or a James Conner or whatever, you're going to be able to get one of those guys in the third round, the Jones, the Carrion, the Freeman, um, maybe Fournette. One of those guys is going to fall back to you. So it really opens things up to allow you to take that wide receiver in one or two because just the way the math plays out, you're going to get one of those guys back to you. Um, now, you, on the other hand, are drafting in the one hole in the full-time fantasy online championship that just went off the other night. So if you want to go over uh, and play in a high-stakes league with some guys who know what they're doing, they've got leagues that start as low as $35. You can go to playffwc.com or go over to fulltimefantasy.com, and you can direct yourself there from their great website. 
and Dwayne was drafting first in this online championship. So let's go through and look at some of the guys that you drafted, who you were high on, um, who you passed on, how you're going to attack this draft board from the one hole doubling up to try to win this big time cash. So maybe for somebody like me who doesn't play in a lot of these online championships, can you just explain a little bit how they work, how long the season is? Um, Can you actually win money doing this? Can you win a lot of money? Um, what is it? Because for 35 bucks, I could get into a league like that as just Joe Blow average fantasy player and, you know, maybe uh, walk away with a few shekels in my pocket. Yeah. And this particular one, yeah, I hope you can win something because it was $299. So this is the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so this sorry. one, this something one is the, this one is the full time fantasy online championship. So it actually works very similar to what you talked about with the Scott Fishbowl. So for the first 13 weeks, you are actually playing everyone else, you know, in your league. And then it goes, you, you play your fantasy playoffs and then based on who wins that. And I got to go back and look specifically on this one, but there's another, I, th- I believe two teams from each league can basically make it into the playoff race, much like some of the other leagues that I've played in, in the past. And then, so for week um, 14, 15 and 16, that three weeks, just like Scott fishbowl, everybody that has either won their league or won points in their league, um, based on the rules, they end up over in this chase. So for the for an additional 50K, like if you win this league itself, you win 13, uh, 1,300, right? So you still want to try to win your league. But in the end, if you win your league or if you're one of the top scoring point gainers uh, across all the teams and all the divisions, then you end up in the uh, chase over the final three weeks. And so this is the full point PPR. Um, it's two. It's one quarterback, two running backs, three receivers, one tight end, and then you have two flex spots plus a kicker and a defense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was fortunate. I drew the one hole. That's my first time, you know, in a real draft. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've done about $1,500 worth of drafts so far um, over these last few weeks. And this is my first one hole. So actually this is one of my, actually I haven't had one that I've actually paid real money for that's I've picked higher than five until this one. So um I went with McCaffrey, you know, first. And my reasoning for that is, um, look, I love Saquon Barkley, Mm -hmm. but I I want no part of Daniel Jones. I'm out. Right. And eventually it's going to happen. That's just going to happen. I'm glad you brought that up because I think so many guys are going to be stuck in that. I'm at one, I'm taking Barkley. And then six, seven weeks into the season, they're looking at their team. and They're going like, oh my God, Daniel Jones is out here and Saquon can't do anything because the team's scoring four points a week. Great point by you. And, and and Barkley is still amazing. You know, last year he dealt with some things like that once Beckham left. Um, and even when o- Odell Beckham Jr. was out, he was he still did his thing. He he's that good, you know. Um, there was an article that came out today on football guy on football guys by Adam Harstead, and it, it basically goes back and compares Barkley to every running back since 1985 at the age of 21 and he comes out, you know, with his comps are to the greatest ever They're to Adrian Peterson and Barry Sanders are his base are basically his comp. So the guy is going to still be amazing. My thought is I just like the security of being on a better team. Um, Ezekiel Elliott would have been my pick if it wasn't McCaffrey Mm -hmm. Um, McCaffrey. I just like because of the PPR floor. I want a guy that every week, I get a I get a floor. Basically, McCaffrey's a floor of 15 points, like in your sleep in this format. He's nearly a 20 point floor because of all the targets. Now Zeke did get you know quite a bit more work through the passing game as well last year. So the one other thing I'll say here, Drake, is you know I'm going to draft 30 teams. <laughs> if if we've got a fantasy owner listening to this and they want to come do one of these, and you pull the one pick, take the guy you want. Look, all four of the top guys are great. Mm-hmm. If you if you love Saquon Barkley, fine, just take him. I'm not taking him because I'm going to draft several teams and I want to get my shares of Christian McCaffrey first. I could do one of these drafts in three weeks and I could tell you, oh man, I own McCaffrey four times now and I may take Saquon first, but I do prefer McCaffrey and I do prefer Elliott. Um, you know, if you love Barkley, I'm not going to you know hate on you for doing it. I just, it's the Daniel Jones thing really scares me. Um, I worry about what their offense is going to look like when that happens. I do like their offensive line. I actually do like Sterling Shepard. I Golden Tate's a nice receiver. Evan Ingram's okay. It's just, we all know it comes down to quarterback play and if quarterback play goes bad. And so think about it, if the giants are one and four, which 
would that surprise you if the Giants went one and four? Their schedule to start the season is pretty dog shit. So they could actually win a few games, which as an Eagles fan hurts me to say. But as you get deeper into it, no, they're not going to be as competitive of a team. I mean, they're going to lose games to the Eagles and to the Cowboys, and they've got to play against the AFC East, so you get the Patriots in there and, uh, you know, an improved Buffalo team. I don't care who they're playing. I still think they could be one and four. Vegas has them at six wins. Mm. They're going to suck. <laughs> so Good. the bottom line is by midseason, you're probably looking at Daniel Jones. I'm like you the know, Grinch so- who stole Christmas when his heart grows three sizes when I hear someone say the Giants are going to suck. It just warms me and makes me feel so good. I, Jim Day, if you're listening, I hope you're throwing a beer across the room. <laughs> I like to make fantasy Taz throw things, especially <laughs> when he's sitting in his easy chair. <laughs> so let's yeah, so it. yeah, go ahead. Go, sorry. Uh, so we're looking at this draft. You, you picked one, and now most people who picked one, obviously, you're going to get a running back. That's just what's going to happen at the first overall pick. Coming back in round two, still the world's your oyster. Now you're on the hook for two. Your decision here was Amari Cooper and Aaron Jones, who we just spoke at length about. Why did you take those two guys? Why did you pass on um, a George Kittle, a Fournette, a Thielen, and go with Jones and Cooper? Well, number one, Vance McDonald is basically my tight end plan this year. I just love him. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to basically take away my ability to take somebody I feel really good about late at a certain position that opens up all this flexibility in these other picks. Now it doesn't mean I won't do something different, which we'll talk about in a minute because I did, but I don't force it. So I didn't want to force it with Kittle. Um, So I did go with Amari Cooper and Aaron Jones. I tend to, when I'm on the turns, unless I'm really trying to dictate and change the way a draft is going, um, I'm typically going to be a little more balanced in the middle. I've, pretty much and just you know I'm playing I'm playing the board I'm taking my guys I'm taking whatever value falls when you're on the on the turns you know you want to be aggressive but at the same time you just don't want to leave yourself open to just getting totally destroyed at a position so I wanted to go with two players I went with Amari Cooper what when I say two players two positions so I went receiver and runner um I went with Aaron Jones we already talked about what I think about Aaron Jones he'll be on plenty of my teams and then the receiver I took was Amari Cooper um, Keenan Allen went right in front of me. Mike Evans was already gone. Juju Smith Schuster was already gone. Odell, Antonio Brown, all those guys were gone. So I was basically looking at Cooper versus T Y Hilton versus Adam Thielen versus AJ green, Stefan Diggs, Edelman and cooks. And to be honest, Amari Cooper just has the most upside of all those guys. I'm with right. You. Love him. If you, if you, if you look at a guy that's going to probably get 27 to 30% of his targets, he's going to fit in that range. He's going to be on a team that's going to run less passing plays than many of the other teams so even though he's going to get that 27 percent, it's not going to equal 160 or 170 targets like some of these other guys but he's a great run after the catch guy he's a perfect fit for what the Cowboys are liking you know to do Um, he and Dak Prescott obviously are going to be in year two now together they go grab a guy to help take some of the pressure off and Randall Cobb Jason Witten yes he's old but he'll help help to take some of the pressure off and then you have a good running game. So I think it's enough from an offensive standpoint, you know, for Cooper, uh, you know, to have some pressure taken off, but at the same time, he gets to be the main guy in the passing game. And the thing I love about Amari is honestly, he's uncoverable. Like the guy, his routes, uh, his separation, top three or four in the league. You know, I, I got him, Keenan Allen, Dante Pettis. I'm sure I'm making somebody mad somewhere. Antonio Brown's obviously, uh, in that conversation, Stefan Diggs is in that conversation, but those are the guys that it's just really tough to cover them. You know, you can't go man on them all the time. You can't go zone on them all the time. So I love what Amari Cooper does. He's actually a lot better against man uh, than what's shown up in zone. And some of that I think is Dak Prescott too. So with Cooper though, I just, when I look at it, T Y Hilton has got to deal with, you know, all these new targets that are coming into town. You got Paris Campbell there. Now we already know Eric Ebron plays. They get Jack Doyle back. You bring in Devin Funches. Not that I love Devin Funches, but for me, T Y Hilton is no longer a guy that's going to see 26, 27% as his upside of targets. He's more like a 22, 23, 24. Now he's a great receiver. Also a guy that separates great and he can do everything really well, but I think Cooper has more upside, you know? Um, so that's why I went that way. AJ green. I love obviously, but there's injury concerns, et cetera. <clears throat> that's why I went with Cooper. The three big tight ends went off the board in the first three rounds of this draft. Probably what you'll see in your home leagues this summer coming back around. Uh, now as you're getting ready for your fourth and fifth round pick, you've got McCaffrey, Cooper, Aaron Jones, 
Obviously, we're not thinking quarterback at all. Uh, no quarterbacks went off the board at this point, and you decide to pull the trigger on one of your favorite guys, and that's DJ Moore from the Carolina Panthers. So the kid's 22 years old, coming into his second year. He is now your wide receiver, too. Why do you choose him over a guy like, let's say, a Cooper Cup or a Mike Williams, Tyler Boyd? What was the, the th- rationale yeah. around DJ Moore? No, it's a great question. And those guys are all close. I, I, I like, uh, I, I'm down on Mike Williams. It's not that I hate him or anything. I just think he, him, he's going, he should be in a tier below these guys. But Tyler Lockett, man, I love Tyler Lockett. He's going to play in the slot all the time now. Um, he and Russell Wilson have got extreme mojo. If I were to not have taken DJ Moore here, my pick would have been Tyler Lockett. Just for the listeners, Chris Godwin went right in front of me. Tyreek Hill was the guy I really wanted. Your dude, I wanted him here um, to be one of these picks. He went in the fourth round. Um, the guys that went after DJ Moore, like you said, Cup and Ridley. So here, here's why I like why I went with DJ Moore over Lockett, over Cup, over Ridley. It's pretty simple. Calvin Ridley, I love him, but he can't he can't overtake Julio Jones as the lead target, mm-hmm. right? And you've got Hooper, and they like to throw to Devontae Freeman, Cooper Cup. He can't, it's one of those deals. You hear me talk about this with all three Rams receivers. I love the offense, but they, they all kind of limit each other's upside. None of them is going to get to, you know, 150, 170 targets. Their upside just isn't there for that. We even saw when one of them got injured, they just plugged the next guy in Josh Reynolds and they keep running their offense. So even if I were to tell myself a story that, well, man, if Brandon Cooks went down, Cooper Cup would just be that much more amazing. Maybe he would, but so far that's not the way it worked. Last year when Cup went down, nobody else really stepped up and got a whole lot, didn't get that many more targets. It was actually essentially, actually everybody's efficiency went down. Um, and I don't think it's so much Cup. That was to do with their offensive line play dropping. But anyway, DJ Moore, on the other hand, he has to, he, he was a first round pick. And I love Curtis Samuel, and I like Greg Olson, but Greg Olson can't stay healthy, and he's old. Curtis Samuel was a second-round pick, and he 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 could be better than DJ Moore. I'm not going to say that he can't. But when I look at that, okay, I got a receiver that just needs to be better than Curtis Samuel, and if he does, he has the potential to kind of pop the lid on 25%, 27%. I don't have him projected at that. I haven't projected at 22%, but – in his realistic range of outcomes, his ceiling is higher than Tyler Lockett. It's higher than Cooper Cup. It's higher than Calvin Ridley. It's higher than Mike Williams because he has a very realistic scenario that could play out to where he ends up with 26, 27% of the targets, right? Where those other guys, look, if you're Calvin Ridley, you're kind of screwed. You're great. You're good. But Julio Jones is getting it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're Cooper Cup, Brandon Cups, Brent, uh, sorry, Brandon Cooks and Robert Woods, they're going to get theirs. If you're Tyler Lockett, I'm sorry, you play in Schottenheimer's offense and the the most targets Doug Baldwin ever saw, uh, you know, in his time in Seattle was 22%. So, and that's on a team that runs the ball 50% of the time. So you've got a team that wants to run, doesn't want to throw more. They've clearly said that, and that's their plan. They're sticking with it. And he only gets 22%. So if Lockett was getting like 25%, I would put him over more, but my thought around more is, and he could more could finish behind all those guys I just said, and they're all probably going to be close, but I just see a higher ceiling. Does that make sense? He reminds me of a shorter AJ green. Is that weird? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, to me, that's like, I would put, you know, whenever I watch him, um, you know, to me, he's more of a, a, ru- a more of a rugged, like Brandon Cooks type of guy, not as fast, like but Steve Smith, who used to be a Carolina like, Panther. Yeah, yeah, rugged. Like he's small, but he's just he's strong. Um, he works mostly underneath. That's the other thing I like about him. You know, he's gonna be. He's. I see an upside for him that could be similar to Michael Thomas. They move him to the slot a lot. They move. He's the flanker. They move him. They motion him inside a lot. They do a lot of different things with him. Um, so it's just about that upside. I, I, I don't, I don't see a way any of those other guys get to 27%. I don't see any of them having a path to 27% target share. And if I were putting a percentage chance on it happening for more, it's probably only 15 to 20%, but for the other guys, it's like 1%. See what I'm saying? So they're all close, but I'm going to go ahead and swing for the upside on the volume with DJ Moore. 
before you even pick DJ Moore, two picks before that, to be honest, this one was surprising to me. It was David Montgomery from the Chicago Bears goes off the board. And is that aggressive? Is it too aggressive? I, obviously, you're trying to win big money in these leagues. You've got to, you know, differentiate yourself somehow. But, boy, round four, uh, pick 10 for Montgomery, that's uh, that's ballsy, is it? Yeah, and part of it, I just look, you know, at the way the draft fell here. You know, uh, the drafter, this guy actually drafted a pretty good team. You can see what his strategy was. He wants to flex runner. Remember, this is a, a two flex league. So he's drafted four runners, Ezekiel Elliott, uh, Leonard Fournette, David Montgomery, and Tevin Coleman. And then he just freaking basically, uh, you know, six six picks in a row, seven picks almost in a row, took receivers, Cup, Fuller, Valdez, Scantling. He snapped me off on Valdez, Scantling. That was going to be my pick in the eighth. Uh, Nikhil Harry, Paris Campbell, Devin Funchess, Tyrell Williams. You know, he just threw everything he could because you have to start three receivers. But that's not – that's in my mind, it's not a bad strategy – because I do this often too, and you'll see it later in this draft. People kept taking all the receivers. It never fell to where the value on the receivers was there for me. Mm-hmm. So I literally just punished them. I took basically every upside runner I could find and left, and left them nothing because I kind of took a similar approach to team three. My thought was, you know what? I'm flexing runner at both positions. So I need to fortify it. I know I need to start three receivers and I'm only carrying, um, you know, six on my roster. Well, I'm carrying seven on my roster but I'm okay with it. I'll work the waiver wire, but I will often do things like that because I don't want to be having to address everything on the waiver wire. The way I'm looking at this team right now is I'm going to work the waiver wire hard on receiver Mm -hmm. and I'll work it hard. If I have an injury, otherwise at runner, I'm probably going to be really patient and I'm just going to stand pat and I'm going to let things play out. And we'll talk about the bottom half of my roster in a minute. You know, it's and the next player I took as a, as a runner too. So you bring up an interesting point before we get to, to that running back, a lot of people I hear in this draft season say, well, I took this strategy and then I'll just make it up on the waiver wire. I'll find a third receiver. I'll find a running back. But sometimes you don't, yeah. you know, and I made that mistake last year in a league because, you know, you're not the only guy with fab money. You're not the always going to have the first waiver claim priority. And sometimes you just don't get that guy. You know, you don't get. Uh, Damian Williams when he comes off the wire and, and hits. So, you know, it, it pays to know what you're doing and pay attention to that second half of your draft and and have some upside baked in, but maybe a little floor too. And we'll see that as we roll through the rest of Dwayne's draft as you picked Kenyon Drake. Now, Drake last year tied for only 28th in the league among running backs for touches. And the team probably isn't going to be very good, but... Uh, Drake could end up being the man now that Frank Gore is gone. Are you curious what they're going to do with him in this O'Shea offense? Um, do you think he's going to play more of a James White role? Do you think he's going to be kind of a Sony Michelle, a mix of both? Uh, I mean, I think he gets. Fifth, I think honestly, yeah, I think he gets to be both because Kalen Balance sucks. <laughs> Thank you. Know, you. We, we we talked to Jarrett Moyer last week. He's got a great. You know, if you guys didn't follow Jarrett, it's uh, at what is it? J. Moyer NFL. Is it? No, I don't think so. But anyway, maybe it is J. Moyer NFL. Or so <laughs> we'll find it out for you guys yeah. before this is completely other. It, yeah, I think it might be that. But great film analysis on Twitter, breaking down the issues with Kalen Balage um, or Balage. And for me, it's just Kenyon Drake. He he played well. He played well enough. He's a good receiver out of the backfield. You talked about Chad O'Shea's offense. Uh there's a scenario where Kenyon Drake's the number two receiver on this team. Yeah, how how good do you feel about Kenny Stills and Devontae Parker? Exactly. This is a receiver core with a lot of question marks, and it is Jay Moyer FB on Twitter. There you go, FB. Yeah, so great follow. If you guys aren't following him, you got to follow him now. So anyway, on Drake, honestly, he's a guy that really, on on my board, he grades out in the same tier, Drake, as and he's at the bottom of it. He's got a little line above him because he's on a bad team. But he's really in the same tier with Derrick Henry, uh, Josh Jacobs, you know, Sony Michelle, guys that are going ahead of him in many cases. Drake is a guy that, you know, you get him in the fifth round. Honestly, I think it's a great value. I don't like the team. I don't expect him to score a lot of touchdowns. But will I be surprised if he catches 70 balls? No, I won't. Will I be surprised if he gets 225 
carries? Nope, sure won't be. I won't be surprised. You know, in my projections, you know how I work them. You know, I'd spend a ton of time looking at the coaches, looking at their tendencies, looking at the roster construction. You know, I go into this stuff, you know, 10 miles deep. I easily, you know, could have given Drake more. But because of the team he's on, I held some of those things, you know, down in, in his median projection. And I think he's the still right now in the fifth round, especially if you need runner. There's other great players. You know, I could have easily went DJ Moore and Tyler Lockett here. Mm-hmm. But again, being on the end, Drake was the last guy I felt that I could go ahead and count on at runner and I didn't want it to dry up on me. And I know I get to use him as one of my flex plays. I'm looking at a guy in Kenyon Drake. And then you just mentioned Derrick Henry. And to me, this just comparison popped in my mind. Kenyon Drake's on a crappy team whose defense stinks. And so your hope is he gets his through the passing game. We're in that same range, you're going to select Derrick Henry, whose defense mm-hmm. is much mm-hmm. better and doesn't do anything in the passing game. And then you're just hoping that he gets everything on the ground and his def. So really, their defenses. You need their opposites. Them. Yeah, they're yes. polar opposites. And it's not just defense. Derrick Henry needs his offense to play really well and play with a lead. Derrick Henry last year, when his team was leading by three points or more. You know, his pace was like 1,500 yards. When his team was trailing by three or more, his pace was like 600 yards. This includes down the stretch when everyone thought Deion Lewis disappeared. He didn't. Deion Lewis was still seeing the snaps. He was still seeing the routes per uh, quarterback drop back. They just didn't have to throw the ball as much because they were leading. They busted some big leads early. And so Derrick Henry benefited from that, and he did really well with it. But people are – Criminally undervalued, Deion Lewis. Yeah, Deion Lewis is criminally undervalued, but right now Derrick Henry's overvalued. He is going to be a roller coaster still this year. People are thinking, "Oh, he's taking the role." Deion Lewis is old news. I, I hate think to tell Deion it. Lewis got drafted in this league. Oh, uh, there he, he is. Did. Okay, he did eleventh yeah. round. Yeah, he got drafted. But you know, my biggest point being, people don't pay attention to the underlying things to know really how involved was a player in a coach's scheme and in their offense. And if you go look, it never changed for Deion Lewis. All that changed is they started leading games. And so that led to the carries for Derrick Henry in that specific game scenario. The other thing to remember is this is a team that brought in, uh, you know, Adam Humphreys. They brought in A.J. Brown. They've got Corey Davis going into his third year. They grabbed Ryan Tannehill in case Mariota's hurt again. This is a team that I expect to pass the ball more than they did last year. And Deion Lewis may be the better fit when they want to be in, in when they truly are ready to go pass. And he still almost caught sixty balls last year. Yeah, people are way, way, way. He he's he's criminally undervalued right now. No way he should be going after guys like he did in this draft um, for the FFWC. There's no way he should be he should be going after Ito Smith, Austin Eckler, Kareem Hunt, Donta Foreman. There's no way. Well, they're different types of picks, right? Guys are taking those picks, hoping that those guys become ones besides Eckler. Eckler is a similar – Eckler and Deion Lewis, they belong in a tier together. They're, they're PPR guys that can fill in for you uh, whenever you've got a bye week. Deion Lewis, the nice thing with him is if Derrick Henry were to get hurt, we've seen Deion Lewis take on the full load and be good. Mm-hmm. So he does carry some additional value that people probably aren't factoring in. But to your point, it's all about roster construction really though. If I'm taking Kareem Hunt, you know, I'm looking for upside. I don't even want Kareem Hunt. I think it's a stupid – I'm sorry. I'm sorry, whoever this team is. I don't mean this to this guy. But it's stupid. A guy's not going to play for the first 10 weeks when you look at their bye. Mm-hmm. That's if he doesn't get suspended for, you know, some of the stuff he's just gotten in trouble for. And he's behind Nick Chubb, who's awesome. I don't get Kareem Hunt, and I'm fine with it. People should keep doing it because it sends me value. And I love getting value in drafts. I'm the same way with Edo Smith. I like him. But he just – he had a chance last year to show more, and he didn't. You know, he he kind of had his shot. And so I didn't really get too excited about Ito Smith last year. I think Devonta Freeman is hands down a far better player than Ito Smith. Um, so Ito Smith, I don't mind drafting him, but it's just funny to me that he goes in the ninth round. Speaking of value, usually you wait and get a guy like Vance Refrigeration McDonald at tight end, but in round six you pulled the trigger on O.J. Howard. So what made you jump up and take the Buccaneers tight end instead of waiting for a guy like Vance? 
It, he just fell too far because I like Howard. He's not in my draft plans this year because usually he goes in the fifth or the fourth round. But to get him in, in the sixth round, I was actually okay with that. Um, and, and the other thing that I was kind of looking to do is a lot of those tight ends were still sitting there. And so I wanted to kind of get it going and then hopefully push – my wide receiver tier was really flat there, right? So when I looked and I saw Robbie Anderson and Corey Davis and uh, Pettis – and then, you know, Christian Kirk and then Marquise Valdez Scantling. I have a lot of those guys really close together. Whereas at tight end, you know, with OJ Howard, I wanted to get it moving and I could still keep Vance McDonald open later, you know, as, as my backup tight end if I wanted. So that's why I went with Howard there. But yeah, you're right. Typically um, in that pick, I'm not, I'm not going to go, you know, with the tight end. And looking back on it now, um, because that was the last pick uh, of the sixth round, Looking back at it now, you know, I mean, I guess I could have – actually, sorry, Corey Davis went right in front of me. And then coming back, then I went Kirk. I just – I'm. do you want to take Kuku – I mean, sorry, Kiki Kuti in the six? I just feel like – I feel like that's a, re- a reach. Curtis yeah. Samuel, uh, you know, I thought some of those guys might come back to me, and I was wrong. That's where, that's where I did kind of mess up a little bit here. I thought, go ahead and take O.J. Howard. Take the value. There's too many guys I like. Honestly, Pettis was my target the whole way in the sixth round. Pettis is a guy that drives me insane because I, I look at every other draft board of this type, and I'll see people drafting in my position. They're just getting Pettis. I'll just get him. Oh, Pettis fell to me. Pettis came to me here. Pettis, and every time I draft, someone takes Pettis around early. <laughs> Every freaking time it drives me nuts because my plan was my six hole was going to be Pettis and Christian Kirk. So it became OJ Howard and Christian Kirk. I would have taken Corey Davis as well. If Corey Davis came to me um, over OJ Howard, it would have been Corey Davis and Christian Kirk. But because those things went, I just, I wasn't going to push it with uh, Curtis Samuel and I already own DJ Moore. Um, I wasn't going to push it on Marvin Jones, Larry Fitzgerald. I just didn't feel any of those things. OJ Howard, I think has 10, 12 touchdown upside. So I went with that. Now, in a home league, Patrick Mahomes is probably going to go in one of the top three rounds. Here, in a more high-stakes setting, he goes in the middle of the sixth. No other quarterback goes until there's a mini run of four guys going in the eighth round. So now you took Howard, and you just mentioned Kirk. So you've got three running backs, three receivers, and a tight end. Then we get to our boy. All right, we're in the eighth round. And Aaron Rodgers goes off right before you. I'm, I'm sure you would have pulled the trigger right there. Just kidding. Uh, and you decide to take Ronald Jones, the running back from Tampa Bay. Could you have gotten him a hair later, do you think? And just, again, in case people are living under a rock when they listen to our show, why are you so high on Ronald Jones this year? Well, for Ronald Jones, it's just simple. You know, he he's the guy that they have the most draft capital in, and he has a chance to win the job. He could be a complete bust. It could be Bruce Anderson. It could be Peyton Barber. It could be a split between all three of them. All of those things could happen. But if I have to put a chip on one guy, it's going to be on Ronald Jones. And this is my eighth or ninth round pick. I can, I can live. I can live with it. I'm much, 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 much more likely. Actually, not not these guys are going five picks apart. That's stupid. He's going six, seven picks apart from Carlos Hyde. Yeah, I like Carlos Hyde, and I've drafted him, you know, several times. But Ronald Jones has a chance to win the starting job. Carlos Hyde is going to be behind Damian Williams, getting maybe 30 40% of the carries. And, yes, something could pop or Damian Williams gets hurt and Carlos Hyde takes over. I expect Hyde to be, you know, more of a committee split. I think Ronald Jones is the guy that has a chance to win the whole role, right? I mean, that's just the way I look at it. And I got him – at the end of the eighth round, after Naheem Hines, I it okay, you know. So for me, Ronald Jones, it's just the, he's too young to give up on. He was being drafted in the third and fourth round of, of drafts at this time last year, but now all of a sudden everybody hates him. What did what what did Ronald Jones do that was so terrible? He had a bad rookie season. It happens. Would you rather see him have a good one? Yeah, but all the same things that made people like him, and I liked him coming out last year. He can be an electric runner. People are like, oh, he ran a 4 6 40. No, he didn't. He's freaking hurt when he ran his 40. If you go look at his old spark scores and you look at some of that stuff and you look at some of the that were, you know, and you can't find necessarily official things, the guy, and if you watch him, he's not a 4 6. 
He doesn't run a four six. And even if he does, he runs way faster than that on the field. So I love Ronald Jones. And I think if you get him in the eighth and ninth round of your draft, if you set your draft up the right way, I'm not saying depend on Ronald Jones as your RB two. Mm-hmm. He's your RB I'm saying four. In, in this case, if Ronald Jones hits, if he if he Ronald Jones is, could easily get two hundred carries and fifty catches. Easy. Mm-hmm. And people are like, well, what about Peyton Barber? Great. If I have a choice between Peyton Barber getting 200 carries and Ronald Jones getting 200 carries, which one do I want to put my chip on? Ronald Jones is it for me because I feel like he he carries the upside. What's so, funny is two rounds before you took Ronald Jones, Darius Geis and Royce Freeman come off the board. Uh, Geis, obviously. Similar, similar situation, yeah. Uh, but Freeman didn't do anything. You know, and he's got Lindsey there, and Lindsey's good. I, but see, this is all recency bias, and mm-hmm. this is what you have to use to your advantage when you're a drafter. You can't you can't just focus on Ronald Jones' short sample size and just come to the conclusion that he sucks. If you do that, you're just going to miss out on things. It happens every single year. Guys that we thought were bad now are good. So Ronald Jones, it's about situation. He has a chance to be this starter. If he doesn't. Again, I didn't go. I didn't have to spend a fifth on him mm-hmm. or a sixth. Royce Freeman cost somebody a sixth. Rashad Penny cost a sixth, right? I mean, Daryl Henderson went in the fifth. Daryl Henderson caught a fifth. Yeah, he cost a fifth. Uh, David Montgomery cost a fourth. And I'm not saying I don't like any of those guys. I do, and I, I work those guys into my draft plans at sometimes. But for me, Ronald Jones is the guy that I'm like, okay. If he breaks one big run in the first preseason game, he's gonna he's gonna be drafted up there with those guys. If Bruce Arians comes out one time and says some fake coach quote about, well, uh, you know, Ronald Jones is my guy, he's gonna move up like two to three rounds because he should be drafted where those guys are, and he's not. So I, I just think it's it's a guy that I'm I take a lot. I take him very often. I don't have to have him every single draft. I am willing to to let him go if I need to, but I draft him quite a bit. So now we're getting into the depth part of your roster here where guys who are going to fill in as your flex and be on your bench for the most part are being drafted. And if I were to ask most people out there, can you name the receiver who finished fourth in the NFL in slot targets? Would they come up with D.D. Westbrook? I don't think so. And you managed to snag him in the ninth round now that he has a competent quarterback in Nick Foles. So... To me, you're getting a possible wide receiver two, wide receiver three at worst. Here is your wide receiver five. What is he? Wide receiver four. Yeah. And this is the roster construction thing. So I went upside with Ronald Jones. I went upside with Christian Kirk. Those are the two picks before. D.D. Westbrook gives me a guy, and he has some upside too. Sure. Um, You know, he could have upside in volume with Nick Foles, right? I mean, the guy, this this is a guy that next year we could be taking the fifth, six rounds like a uh, Tyler Boyd. We they could don't all have saying, that tight end to lean on like yeah. Philadelphia did. So him coming out of the slot could be just like Philly does with Zach Ertz. It could be he could be a hundred and thirty, a hundred and forty target guy, and I think that's a potential outcome for him. I took him because I I know that at a minimum he's going to be one hundred and ten to one hundred and twenty targets, and if Christian Kirk doesn't do well for me. And I'm, and if I don't know enough about Ronald Jones come week one, he can plug into my second flex spot. Sure. Kenan Drake will be my first DD Westbrook will be my second flex. And then I can figure it out from there. Right. As things start to unfold, who knows week one, all of a sudden Ronald Jones goes nuts. We didn't expect it next week. Great. Ronald Jones, we'll just put you in DD Westbrook. You can stay on the bench, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to give myself, you know, a more high floor player because I thought, I thought about going to kill Harry. You know, I thought about going with, you know, an Anthony Miller or even a James Washington. But again, it's roster construction. I had just done Kirk and Jones. D.D. Westbrook, I thought, gave me some leeway to give those guys a little time early in the year. And he could step in as my flex. And he still carries a little upside, like you said himself. We're heading into round 10 here of Dwayne's FFWC draft. And again, if you want to do these yourself, go over to playffwc.com and for as low as 35 bucks, you can get into one of these drafts. And who knows, maybe you can walk away with a couple of grand. Uh, we know Dwayne has won some big money playing in tournaments over the years. So that's why his information is so valuable to the fantasy football fans out there. And we're glad you're listening. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Football Hustle. Of course, follow the show at FF Hustle on Twitter. You can follow me at Drake Fantasy. 
Follow Dwayne at Dwayne McFarland. Make sure it's, you spell it D W A I N. I always say that. I don't know if somebody spells it like D W A Y N E. If there's a different Dwayne McFarland, I might make that account and just post really shitty fantasy advice. <laughs> so somebody can follow the, the you know, that would be like funny. the NWO <laughs> Dwayne McFarland uh, for you wrestling fans out there. So we're into the 10th round here. And here, this is an interesting pick. And this could be a guy you drop you know, four weeks into the season, or it's a guy who could be like, wow, that dude's smart. And it's Albert Wilson, the wide receiver from the Miami Dolphins, who, before he got hurt, had a couple of really nice weeks. So what drew you to Wilson here in the 10th? I love Albert Wilson. <laughs> I'm I'm addicted to Albert Wilson. Let me just, I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and put that on the record. Normally, I, I'm taking Wilson 11th, 12th, 13th round, but because this is start three receivers and the way I built my roster to this point, I didn't want to risk not getting him. And here's why. Chad O'Shea's offense coming over from New England. Albert Wilson is going to be the guy that gets the chance to have the Julian Edelman role. So Chad O'Shea, just like I talked about earlier with Kenyon Drake, likes to use the running backs. You know, it comes from an offense that loves to use the running backs in the passing game. I just wrote an article about this for at Mount. Uh, for Matt Waldman, RSP.com about New Orleans and New England's passing game. Jarrett Moyer and I actually did that together. So if you guys haven't seen it, go check it out. But the other part, right, is that Z or flanker and then the slot receiver. And they move Albert Wilson all over the place. He's the guy most likely to win that role. And if he does, again, not going to be a great team, but it's a guy that could surprise you with 120, 130 targets. That's within his range of outcomes. Yes, within his range of outcomes is 60. But a lot of guys you draft at 10 in round 10, 11, and 12, they don't have legitimate upside to that kind of target volume without an injury in front of them. So if you look at the guys that went after or right before I I picked, right, you know, you got Paris Campbell, you know, he doesn't have that kind of upside, you know, for that many times. I love Paris Campbell. I love him. And he has a better quarterback, <laughs> you know, and, and, I, and I try to draft the guy. I do try to draft Paris Campbell. That's the other thing, just because my rankings say one thing, I'll, I'll draft Paris. I've been in leagues where I've drafted Paris Campbell and then draft Albert Wilson two rounds later. And this one, Paris Campbell goes in front of me. I'm just using it for comparison's sake. I think Albert Wilson actually has a higher ceiling as far as targets, right? From a standpoint of he could literally be the number one targeted option on the Miami Dolphins. Now, what you have to watch with him, one, we got to make sure his hip's okay because he hurt that midway through the season last year. Number two, I went back and watched all of his games then I looked at a lot of his uh, route running data. 20% of his passes came on slot routes. I mean, not slot routes. 20% of his passes came on screens. His huge game tame, came on two screen passes against Chicago, where right. he just busted these long bubble screens for touchdowns. He's If he's going to play the Julian Edelman role, we have got to see him run more routes in preseason. He's got to be able to show that he can he can separate on the quick little out routes, the option routes, you know, he's got to be able to – he can't just run drags and bubble screens all day. Otherwise, defenses will figure him out, and then he's a gadget player. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to watch in the preseason. Right now, we haven't had preseason. So I'm assuming that he's going to figure those things out. The Dolphins gave him a decent amount of money. You know, not a lot, but a decent amount last year to come in as somebody that a lot of people didn't know anything about, and they had a plan for him. Now Adam Gase left. But I think O'Shea coming in is actually a good fit. So um, Kenny Stills should be outside. Devontae Parker should be outside. Al Robert Wilson should be the guy playing inside as well as moving outside to the Z. So we'll have to keep an eye on it in preseason. But as of today, I see him as a guy that can have a lot more upside than what most people think. Let me ask you this. So your roster construction here, I'm checking out your team here in this FFWC draft. You've got two players each from Tampa Bay and Miami, neither of whom are expected to be very good teams. Are you concerned by that? Is that something that you thought of during the draft or after it, you go, oh, shit, I just took a couple of guys on some really bad teams? Or do you not care because you just think their volume is going to be worth the pick? I don't care if the value's right. You know, if I get a, I don't want to force players like that. I don't want to, in the fourth round and fifth round, take two players from terrible teams, you know, or from the same team. Mm -hmm. But if I'm talking OJ Howard in the sixth round, which I get at a value, and then Ronald Jones, who has a legitimate chance to be the starting running back on his team, and I can get him in round eight, I could care less that they're on the same team. I also happen to like Bruce Arians. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not against it. And, and the Bucks, as bad as they are, their offense really isn't a problem. <laughs> you yeah. know, their offense, yeah, they turn it over too much. But as far as fantasy goes, their offense is fine. So I don't feel bad. Now, 
Miami, that could be a complete shit show. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be bad. You know, they don't have a good offensive line. They don't know what they're going to do it. You know, I mean, I know they've got, you know, Fitzpatrick and then they've got Rosen, but that could be messy when they're not being protected. You know, the receivers aren't that good. The defense isn't that good. I mean, that, that team has a lot of problems. They could, they could, they could literally win zero games. So <laughs> do I ideally want to own a bunch of guys from Miami? No, it's just the way that this particular you know, draft went, you know, and when I think about a bad team like that, that, that you don't have a lot of competition as far as, you know, getting fed. That's why I like Kenyon Drake. It's like really, Oh, Devonte Parker's going to take away from you. Yeah, probably not. You know? So I, and I, Mike Gusecki another guy that I find myself drafting often. Do I want to own all three? Not necessarily, but if I'm getting one of them in the fifth and I'm pretty, feel pretty good about Drake, Albert Wilson's an easy release. And Gasicki is an easy release too. If I take him in like the 14th round, the other way to look at it is one of those guys has to be the main guy <laughs> because I don't like the others. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking a shot on him. I really like your next two picks. And these are guys I'm going to be targeting in the Scott Fishbowl. And maybe I have to do it a little earlier. I'm almost back up on the clock in that draft, by the way. Nice. Uh, the first is a guy who every you didn't even tell you didn't even tell us who you took. Oh, I took Aaron Jones. Uh, All right. In that yeah. because nice, and then immediately like a bunch of auto picks happened, which is great because I know they're not taking Tyreek Hill. If it comes back to me, I have one pick until it's my turn, and Tyreek Hill's on board. I'm going to take him. Do it in the fourth round. So, sticking with your draft here, everyone thinks Justice Hill is this small little receiving back. Okay, he's five ten, and in 2016 he led college football in rushing at Oklahoma State. He's not. Theo Riddick, who I, I, for some reason I think people kind of pigeonhole these rookies and they go, all right, what is he? How can I put him in in this box? Okay, Justice Hill is is going to be this just small pass catcher, and, and I mean he's only 190 pounds uh, at 5'10", but he's a good runner too, and I really like him in Baltimore. I think he's going to be a nice addition to that offense. Heaven forbid if Mark Ingram goes down. But they're going to run the ball 800,000 times. And if he's going to catch anything out of the backfield, bonus. Yeah. For for me, Justice Hill is a big play waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, he showed that in college. Um, this is a very, they, they've got a good scheme to work with there that creates a lot of nice running lanes. It doesn't, the runners don't have to do as much in this scheme. A lot of things are created off off of the action that Lamar Jackson provides because he's such a threat as a runner, and so it creates it creates advantages, you know, for the runners and even guys with lesser vision and things like that can be successful. I think the way you have to look at this team is they love multiple everything. They run twenty tight ends out there. They want to rotate thirty <laughs> receivers. You know, um, hell, last year to start the season they were rotating quarterbacks. This is a team that is really moving in a direction that I think they're trying to, it's funny because they're going old school running smash mouth, but at the same time they're, they're getting real creative with the way they're handling their roster with all these guys that they rotate in and out of the the lineup. So the thing you have to remember last year is this team at all times used three backs at all times. So this is an eight man high school football team. That's what the Baltimore (laughs) Ravens are. Well, the bigger takeaway here is don't draft Mark Ingram in the fourth or fifth round, it's not worth it. He's going to play Gus Edwards role. He's going to get 40% of the carries each week. And if Lamar Jackson doesn't take the rushing touchdowns, he's going to get those. So you have a guy that's not going to catch a lot of balls. He's going to be game script dependent. He's going to have weeks where like, Oh, I love Mark Ingram. I got 120 yards and two touchdowns. The next week, he's going to have the same number of carries. He's going to have 50 yards with no catches, one target, no touchdowns. And it won't be because they didn't get in the red zone. It'll be because Lamar Jackson ran in with two. So to people's point around Justice Hill, Hill is going to, Hill is likely to rotate in with Kenneth Dixon. Kenneth Dixon still is officially ahead of Justice Hill on the depth chart. Mm-hmm. My plan good. actually is I, I like Dixon a lot too. Yeah. He was really good down the stretch and people are completely forgetting him. He didn't get drafted in Absolutely. this draft. And normally I take both of them. I just kind of got in a pinch later and I made a different decision based on having Aaron Jones. I went, you'll see, I went with Dexter Williams. So that was originally my pick where I would have taken Kenneth Dixon and I still needed to take my, you know, defense and my kicker. And then I wanted to take one more swing at receiver because I only own six and you need to start three. So having said all that, why I still take Justice Hill first 
is because a he goes higher in drafts, and two he's the guy that I feel like he could flash in the preseason, and all of a sudden he gets a bigger role. Mm-hmm. Right? He could be the guy like a Philip Lindsay. He could be the guy, you know, I don't know, just you know, you name whoever it was. But but think back to how small Chris Johnson was. <clears throat> he was just a super fast blazer, and nobody thought anything about Chris Johnson. Then all of a sudden preseason came around, and you're like people are like, holy crap. This Chris Johnson guy is just like breaking off 40, 50 yard runs in the preseason. And he, you know, running for like whatever, 12, 13, 1400 yards as a rookie. I drafted Philip, Chris Johnson as a rookie. That's and right. that's So I, I feel like Justice Hill right now is that's not in his, in the deck of cards for him, but he's a great guy to stash. And his role could grow as the season goes. And if Ingram gets hurt, if Ingram gets hurt, it's most likely, unless they cut, cut him, Gus Edwards is going to take that role. But I just see Justice Hill as being a guy that I think about the way this running game works and how huge some of the lanes and things are. And I'm like, man, this guy, with the speed element that he brings, that's something the other backs don't have. It's just a guy I like to stash. And then Madison, man, just talk about a fit. So Gary Kubiak is now, you know, basically helping run the Vikings offense, you know. Uh, Kevin Stefanski is actually the offensive coordinator, but he is there to um, consult, you know, with him and, and help with the offense. So he's, they're installing his running game, which is great for Kirk Cousins because Kirk Cousins is a really good play action passer. And now he's going to get to use a lot more of that. But when you look at a guy like Alexander Madison, you know, he's a patient runner. Um, he's not real flashy. He's kind of just functional, does everything really well. He's the kind of guy that fits really good in Gary Kubiak's scheme, and he's a good pass catcher too. So whereas Latavius Murray was kind of the thunder, right, to Dalvin Cook's lightning, Madison has a, a pass catching skill set that could actually allow him, his his application within the offense could be broader than what Latavius Murray's was. And so the way I look at Madison is you could have a potential bye week flex play right out of the gate. He's going to probably see 30% of the carries and he could get some passing work. And if you're in a pinch, that could be, you know, your, your number two flex in a league like this. Then we have the potential that Dalvin cook, you know, could be injured. We Hmm, we know that we've seen that before. If that happens, Alexander Madison could be a league winner. Now, and a lot of people are talking about other backs on, on the roster and there are some guys there and things could happen, but this is a guy that, you know, they, they, they invested a third round draft pick. That's, that's a decent pick for a runner, a right? Day two these, pick, absolutely. These days, so I like Madison, and I feel like he was a hand selection from Kubiak. Is the way I look at it. Kubiak's like, I'm installing this scheme. If Dalvin Cook goes down, we need somebody that we feel we can turn around and lean on. They can handle the workload. He's a bigger guy, mm-hmm. and then he fits in the scheme. Could and easily I easily take the goal line work. From this Dalvin guy can Cook. win you your league. He can win you your league, and I've taken him in every draft mm-hmm. I've done. Every draft, this guy's been on my team. Justice Hill's on about 50% of them. Alexander Madison's on all of them. A guy who won me a league in 2013 is Josh Gordon. And you took him here in round 13. Mind you, he still has not taken a quarterback. We're 13 rounds into this draft. I love this selection. The Patriots, this is me conspiracy theory thinking. The Patriots know Josh Gordon's going to get reinstated. Tom Brady's not wasting his time playing catch with him and they're keeping him around on the roster and they're putting a second round tender or whatever they did on him in the off season. They know he's going to get reinstated. And when he does come mid July, Josh Gordon's going to have a fifth round ADP and you just got him in round 13. That's awesome. Well, thanks man. The way, the way I look at it is even if the Patriots don't know that, This is about roster construction again. So I took Amari Cooper. I took DJ Moore. I've got Christian Kirk. Then I kind of got my baseline guy, Westbrook. Albert Wilson's a sneaky guy in the right offense at the right time. But all the other receivers just kept going. I wanted Marquise Goodwin, right? I I wanted some of these other guys, and it didn't work out that way. And since I only, you know, in in a league where you have to start three receivers plus you get two flex, I mean, typically you want to carry seven or eight receivers. Well, I'm sitting here at this point, you know, and I've only got five on my roster. And with the way it went, because of what I did with the runners, and I did that intentionally because they kept doing this at receivers, and I just kept taking the value they left. And so the way I looked at it is Josh Gordon come week one, if I if he's not going to be, you know, reinstated or whatever, he's suspended half the season, or let's say he's out for the year, I can cut him easy. I'm drafting way early. Somebody's going to be hurt. And there's going to be that first week great waiver run. 
and Josh Gordon's my easy cut. Mm-hmm. Unless what you just said, he gets reinstated, and guess what? Then he just bumped Christian Kirk from my starting lineup. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or he's my flex, right? Instead of DD Westbrook. And so it's just it's about roster construction, man. And and it's it, the DD Westbrook pick. You know, a lot of people look at that pick and oh, I don't like DD Westbrook. It okay, great. But it's about roster construction. That gave me the ability to turn around and take a guy like Josh Gordon. Mm-hmm. Um, because I had that. If I if I with my DD Westbrook pick, you know, had just swung, you know, upside, you know, with James Wash- yeah, with that or you know, James Washington, whatever the case might have been, I would have felt a little less comfortable, you know, with Josh Gordon as my selection there. Mm-hmm. And and Josh Gordon, I probably could have waited, but I specifically I wanted to just make sure I got him because I thought, you know, I I didn't get a ton of good receivers on this team. Who's a guy that if things went right, all of a sudden is in my starting lineup as a receiver, as a flex player. At this point in the draft, Josh Gordon is kind of the guy. <laughs> He was good you know. last year while he was on the field for the Patriots. Nothing wrong yeah, with him. I mean, he's not setting the world on fire, but he's fine. He's very startable for fantasy in that offense. Right. Please, right? Man, no, so so again, it's easy easy cut come week one if I need to. If not, it, it's something that makes my team way better. Same round, you took Josh Gordon, Drew Brees, Cam Newton, Kyler Murray, Jared Goff, all come off the board at quarterback. You still don't have one. You don't end up taking one until two rounds later. Uh, we can kind of gloss over these guys. We're eight hours into this podcast. Mike Davis and Malcolm Brown you take because, hey, why not? Upside, somebody gets hurt, you got the lead back there. Dak Prescott in the 16th round. In a league where he's going to run, he's going to have Amari Cooper. I think his final four or five games, he was a top five quarterback last year. What great value at quarterback for you to get in the 16th round. And, and it's not honestly so much about Dak. I'm fine with Dak, but I would have been fine with Phillip Rivers. I would mm-hmm. have been fine with Mitch Trubisky. I would have been fine with Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, I took Dak because I do like the running, and I thought, oh, you know, if it works out right, I've got Amari Cooper. I don't expect him to throw 40 touchdowns. I know that's not happening, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but I'll take the double ups when I can get them, right, with Amari on the team. But it, here's what else I know. I just – they're playing uh, the Redskins week one, I believe. It's the Redskins or the Giants. They have a good matchup week one. So I'm basically going to be streaming quarterback. These other guys all took three, two and three quarterbacks. They're going to drop half of these. That so blows my somebody, mind. Else's, somebody else's second or third quarterback right now mm-hmm. come after the week one waiver wire is probably going to be my starting quarterback come week three when Dak Prescott has a bad matchup. <laughs> so I just, the bigger takeaway, honestly, and we glossed over it is I just kept, they kept leaving all these runners. Mike Davis could be the starter in Chicago week, week one. We know Todd Gurley's got a bad knee. Malcolm Brown is going to get half the work. If Todd Gurley goes down, it's going to help Daryl Henderson too, but Malcolm Brown's going to all of a sudden have fantasy value. So it's not just taking anybody. It's, it's, it's about being taking guys that, man, if this goes this way, this could win your whole league. And then Dexter Williams um, took a swing on him, and that's I've got Aaron Jones. And I just – Jamal Williams just has never done anything. So I feel like, you know, Dexter Williams could actually be the two, so I'm getting a handcuff to Aaron Jones. And then obviously our, our – uh, oh, you should be so happy, Drake. Look at that. The I Eagles see. and Elliott. You I realize went who the best team in the NFC is, and it's the Philadelphia Eagles, especially the NFC East, and you went and uh... – uh, oh, I, sorry, I'm on the clock now, by the way, in the Scott Fishbowl. Yeah, the, um, the Eagles just have a great schedule. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm good with that. I like their first game, uh, and I expect them to play ahead a lot, which actually is one of the most important thing about defenses. Let me just say a quick thing about defense. Uh, Chicago Bears went in the 11th round uh, of this draft. This guy, and this is funny, this guy was trash talking. Like, I, I, I don't really trash talk. I don't talk, but I was just – seeing him make fun of everybody else's teams and people were arguing with him. This is the guy that took the bears in the 11th round. So usually the bears will go in like the 12th, 13th round. Don't do it. But if no. you go look at their schedule, they Maybe. play a boat. They hang on. They play boatload of good quarterbacks. The number one thing I found about defense is you just find the ones playing the worst quarterbacks. The bears this year are playing almost the absolute fewest bad quarterbacks as good as they are. They have got a terrible schedule. 
do not reach for the Bears. Do not reach for them. And the, Eagles, the, the Eagles are going to play a bunch of bad quarterbacks, and they're going to be playing from ahead. What you want are teams with a good offense, mm-hmm. with a decent defense, that are going to play a bunch of bad quarterbacks. That's your recipe for fantasy defense. So what you do is you find your three or four, and then you know each draft. The other one is the Patriots. The Patriots, I don't like what they've done with their defense, but they get to play a lot of bad quarterbacks. And they're going to be a team that's smart. They're going to play from ahead. So the Patriots are another one. You know, so if you're in a best ball league, you match the Eagles and the Patriots together, you're going to dominate like over the first seven weeks if you go look at the schedule, just between those two defenses. Broncos, be careful. You're going to have to play the Chiefs twice. You're going to have to play the Chargers mm-hmm. twice. You know, good defense, but they do not have a very good schedule. So that's this that's the thing that you got to go look at. Same thing, you know, you know, with the Chargers is not as bad because they don't have to play themselves, right? But they still have to play uh the Chiefs. And the Bears, people don't want to think about this, but they have a new coordinator and they're switching to a three four defense. So we don't know how that's all gonna play out. Uh it could be great and they could be seamless and they could be awesome, or there could be some growing pains there. Uh, yeah, and- but for the most part, they were really a three four anyway. Mm. If you look at the scheme that they ran, you know, last last season, I know a lot of people called it a four three. But yeah, they do have a new defensive coordinator. They made some good moves on defense. The biggest thing really is just they play a lot of good quarterbacks. You know, so you want to be careful. And with the Eagles, just again, they're going to play Eli slash Daniel Jones twice, Dwayne Haskins twice. They get the Bills and they get the Jets and yes. they get the Dolphins. So that's my point. You just named exactly. That's why you take the freaking Eagles. The Cowboys are in play um, as well. You know, I, I did, I did a little thing on this just because, you know, I've been drafting so much and I haven't paid a ton of attention to defense yet. And then I started doing some best balls. uh, So I needed to kind of get my strategy down around it. But basically the teams I have graded at the top for your defenses uh, are um, New England, Philly, Dallas and Baltimore. And if you go look at their schedules and you're in a best ball, you can actually, I, I color code it. And then I look at it in three week increments and I try to, cause I'm going to take three defenses in a best ball. That's just mm-hmm. the way I do it. Um, what I try to do is match, match the teams together that kind of alternate who gets to play the sucky team. Right. Yeah. So um, if you look, for example, at new England weeks, four, <laughs> Weeks four, five, and six, they get to play the Bills, the Redskins, and the Giants. If you pair them with Baltimore, Baltimore gets to play Miami and Arizona out of the gate. Now they're going to get Kansas City in week three, but New England gets the Jets. So those two teams, those those two defenses match perfectly together. First six of the week, six weeks of the season, you're probably going to be leading the league in defensive uh, points scored, you know, by your defense. In a redraft league, your home league with your buddies, would you advocate the two defense strategy and doing what you just no. talked about? No, 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 no. Just take one, take one. And, and Mace, if you're taking one, you, you take what I just said and you look at those teams that have the great first two or three games. Mm-hmm. And so if you want to take Baltimore, that's fine. You want to take the Eagles. That's okay too. And then guess what? Somebody's going to drop the Patriots because they have a bad matchup, I think, in week two. And then you're going to pick them up week three before they play the Jets. And then you're going to use them in week four, five, and six. So I do advocate at sometimes carrying two defenses just to make the preemptive pickup, preparing for that next run of games. And then you and then you could dump, you know, Baltimore because you know their schedule may get tougher for four or five games. Well, guess what? Some other guy in your league, oh man, he just dropped the best defense, and they're going to go pick them up, and then they're going to be like, well, crap. Baltimore's not scoring any points for me. Then they're going to drop them, and then you're going to get rid of the Patriots in week six, and then you're going to pick Baltimore back up. Week six. It's funny doing that. You know, Something home leagues. We definitely have to look at that more as we go into our show during the regular season is focusing on defenses on the waiver wire to pick up because, man, that matters. I've seen it so many times in leagues where a guy with a dominant defense, be it Baltimore, Chicago, whatever, they win your league because you're getting 20 something points from this defense. You're like, I can't beat this. My defense scores five points. This guy's smoking me. It doesn't matter what I have in my starting lineup. The best rule is just get rid of team defense from your fantasy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not joking. Defense it's, kicker. It's, get it's, both the, it's the least predictable component. Unless you just want more luck in your fantasy league, which that's okay. That's legit. If you want more luck in your fantasy league, keep defenses because if you start a, a one or two defenses all year long, 
you're mostly depending on luck. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, the best way to handle defense is if your team, if your league does it, the best way to handle it is let the top defenses go and you find the mid tier defenses or the defenses people have forgotten about, like the Eagles that have the right matchups. You go from there. Dwayne, we're 90 minutes into this thing. We got to close up shop. Who are you here. picking? Who are you picking? Uh, I took Tyreek Hill. I just got back on the clock and I already, so, I took so Aaron him. Jones and Tyreek Hill. That's a, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. How you uh, feel? A couple of auto picks went around right after me. Wentz went with the very next pick. So I won't have Carson Wentz on my squad this year, but that's okay. I'm sure I'll be fine with whoever comes back through. And I'm fine with that. So my squad right now is uh, Melvin Gordon and Aaron Jones are my running backs. I've got Tyreek Hill and I've got Zach Ertz. So I've got guys who could finish number one at their position at tight end and receiver and i've got guys who could finish in the top 10 at running back so there's nothing wrong with that at all it's all a little stuff. i love it i love it yeah well anything final thoughts here before we get out uh any crazy guys you're going to target at the end of the scott fishbowl no i mean we just talked about a lot of these guys i think you know in the next few weeks we'll come back and as the season gets closer uh i think you know you and i talked about earlier you know, folks are wanting more stuff on strategy. I think we'll do a few shows. One on if you're drafting at the early part of the draft, mm-hmm. here's what to expect. And here are the things to be thinking about. If you're drafting in the middle, here's what to think about. And if you're drafting at the end, here's what to expect and what to be thinking about. And what what I think we can do for our listeners is get them prepared to the, the range of players they're going to be looking at um, and the ramifications of going in certain directions and what it may do to your draft down the line. So that ultimately, hopefully we're helping folks being, we help folks be prepared to handle any scenario Mm -hmm. and really be thinking multiple steps ahead, but still be flexible based on what happened, what happens. So I'll be doing several more, several more drafts before, you know, that gets here and hopefully, you know, we can use, and I know you are too, so we can share those insights that we've gained uh, with the audience. Roster construction is key. And that's why Dwayne is a big winner in these tournaments and, That's why you're listening to this show, folks, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, So for Dwayne McFarlane, I am Brian Drake. Please remember to follow our show at FF Hustle on Twitter. I'm at Drake Fantasy. He's at Dwayne McFarlane. And, of course, please go over to footballguys.com and read his work. Lord knows they need the clicks, right, Dwayne? Yeah. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We'll see you guys later. Thanks for stopping by. This has been the Fantasy Football Hustle. We're back next week with all you need for waiver wire, trades, roster management, and more. Until then, never get out hustled.